Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the House of Kayfabe. And it is quite a house today. We have got Adam Harris with us, Derek Jones. We have got Stephen Barker and the one and only Stephen P. New. And from what I understand, we are about to be graced with Matt Mullins. And actually, Derek Jones will not be here very long, but we are going to talk to him while he's here. And we are talking about the biggest story in professional wrestling. First of all, we started with Vince McMahon and Vince McMahon got in a little bit of trouble. We've talked about that already and we've discussed it in detail, but now he's retired. And when he retired, Triple H and Stephanie McMahon have taken control of the WWE and all the fans in the entire universe <laughs> are talking about, is this a good thing? Or is this a bad thing? Or is anything even going to change? And we are going to discuss that today. And the best person to start with is Derek Jones. Derek Jones, when you found out that Vince McMahon retired, what did you think? It's bittersweet, to be 100% honest. It truly is. Because he has, at one point in time, gave us some of the best television we've ever seen. Recently, not so much. Right. But at, but at one time he was the end all be all of television for myself. The, the attitude era stand alone against anything on television period is some of the most compelling and entertaining content the world has ever seen. Even into the two thousands. I mean, yeah. even into the two thousands. I mean, I would even, I would even venture to say 10 years ago. Just just 10 years ago, we were we were seeing some good quality stuff from the WWE. So we can't just blame uh, or we can't just look at Vince McMahon on the last six months or the last five years or, or anything like that. You have to look at the whole scope. And really, when it comes down to it, this man really did create our childhood. Uh, you, professional wrestling has always been the biggest thing in, in my life as a child and even as an adult. And I can say that Vince McMahon is what it, it, I mean, that is what brought me to the dance was Vince McMahon's ideas. Now, Stephen P knew he's got a different world out there. And, and even Stephen Barker that uh, Vince McMahon wasn't a part of them becoming a wrestling fan. Or am I wrong with that? Stephen P knew. Well, for me, and, and I'll let Barker speak for himself in just a moment, but WWF, when I started watching wrestling was the Northeast territory. You know, they ran New York and D.C. and Boston, and they recorded in um, Bethlehem, PA, or one of those, mm -hmm. you know, Eastern PA towns over there. That's where they recorded that stuff. And you guys have heard me talk about those Madison Square Garden shows where if USA Network in 1981 or 82 or 83 didn't have any programming, they'd throw a WWF show, they'd, they'd cross up with MSG and they'd show a Madison Square Garden uh, show. So that was WWF to start with me. And then they got that USA Network Sunday at 12 noon, uh, All American Wrestling. That's where I first got introduced to Vince McMahon. They started doing it. There was a show. If you haven't watched it, Tuesday Night Titans. It was a talk show type format. Nothing had ever been done in wrestling like that before. But the fan in me, like the territories wrestling, the Southern product, mid-Atlantic, world-class, that type stuff, Georgia, better Florida, better than I liked the WWF product. But, man, in January of 84, guys, when Hulkamania hit and he beat the Sheik and he came out to eye the Tiger, that it it changed wrestling and wrestling came out from the dark, you know, where it was like the seedy kind of people didn't really talk about it. Nobody owned up to being a wrestling fan in the mid 80s. You couldn't admit being a wrestling fan. What are you, some kind of homosexual or something? You like to look at oiled up men tanned yes. in their boxer shorts. In fact, I do. Uh, but I'm 13. I believe I'm straight. So. But, man, all of a sudden, it's Saturday night's main event. There's a cartoon on TV on Saturday mornings. I can watch 
wrestling on Saturday freaking morning cartoons. And it was mind-blowing. PWI, Vince McMahon does this, you know, uh, I want to be the Walt Disney of wrestling. And you've got Mania once a year, the biggest thing going up against Starcade, their big show class, the champions. And it was it was a really great time to be a wrestling fan. McMahon's got the mic. If, if you're a teenager, you don't know that he that Titan Sports belongs to him. You know, he's the guy who's at the announce desk. He's the guy. So that's where it starts with me. If I tap into being a teenager, I love Vince McMahon. I love that he's the baby face cheering Mark, you know, who just loves wrestling. And, that you know, and then you've got the Black Saturday where he comes to Georgia. You know, if you don't know that, kids out there watching, go watch Vince McMahon in front of the World Championship Wrestling banner in about 1985. So that it, story it time. It still doesn't seem right. It still doesn't look right. It doesn't seem right. That story time with Stephen P. New, a little history lesson. But that was my exposure to McMahon before the ice cream bars, toys, uh, gimmicks, like Brother Love and Undertaker and uh, Gator, who was Steve Kern, who was a wrestler that you I mean, loved. You, you mean Skinner. Skinner, same thing. Skinner. Uh, <laughs> anyway. He actually was a Gator hunter. Did you yeah, know Yeah, he was a Gator hunter, and Barry Windham was the Widowmaker or the Stalker or whatever. And so no, no, Texas no, Tornado. Did, did you know Steve Kern is actually – a gator yeah, hunter, of course. Like, not not yes. by character. This man goes in the fucking swamp and and gets right. gators out. And it's Kerry true. Von Eric was a Texas tornado from about eighty four <laughs> to eighty eight. Yes. So anyway, that's kind of the serious, the, Steve. He really the, caught gators. It's a real story out there. <clears throat> right. Anyway, go ahead. Cool story, bro. Anyway, <laughs> so that was my first exposure to McMahon on that end of it, and I always just kind of viewed him as like a competitor to to traditional wrestling, Southern-based products seem more real. McMahon's seemed more appealable to kids with the dolls and the ice cream bars and that kind of stuff. So, which is why I'm sure that to guys your age, 10, 15 years younger than me, that's why that feels, you know, more like your childhood than it does mine. Those were my teenage years. But take, look, look at that right there. That's Sid Justice versus Jake the Snake Roberts, October the 1st of 1991. Rowdy Roddy Piper, Legion of Doom versus the Natural Disasters, sponsored by Key Radio in Huntington, West Virginia. Oh, wow. I was at that nice. house show. I've been at I've been at a lot of them. So, you know, it was still a but, very high quality product. The one thing I'd ever promote McMahon for is the production value. He wanted, as Derek said, television that rivals anything else. That's what WWF, WWE did better than anybody else was he wanted those production values, the expensive cameras, the expensive sound, and, and he wanted his superstars to look like a million bucks. So on the from the fan side, that's what I always remember as. But but Vince McMahon was not a part of your first introduction to wrestling. Sure. He wasn't, right? No. Correct. That was ICW. And right. Brought, Ronnie, the one man gang Garvin. And and Stephen Barker, your first introduction to wrestling had nothing to do with Vince McMahon. Not one thing. <clears throat> uh, because I grew up in an Appalachian Dickensian tale, we didn't have USA Network. And to me, a, the, uh, Hulk Hogan, the WWF, uh, existed in the magazines that I would go to Kroger and buy. So I was a 605. That's what got me into wrestling. Then I found AWA and World Class because they both had deals with ESPN. Back when ESPN was just showing anything, they used to show uh, like surfing. I mean, they just Ro anything. Roller, der roller, roller derby. derby. Yeah, I watch roller derby. So I will tell you the first <laughs> time I ever saw WWE was on Saturday Night's Main Event because it was on Channel 3. It was on NBC. And I want to guess it's 84 five six or seven because we didn't get usa till way later because i grew up in nowhere and i think it was like the main event may have been hulk hogan and king kong bundy 
but because I was so, you know, by that time, I'd already been to a few, I'd been to two, Pat, two, uh, uh, great American bashes. I've been to some other house shows and I was very ingrained in what NWA looked like. And the, and the very first match I ever saw on that Saturday night main event, and this might be able, someone could find this. It was Coco beware. And I was like, what the fuck is that bird going <laughs> like you know like i would like rick flair dusty Rhodes, blood feud totally blanchard magnum ta blood feud von eric's versus the free birds blood feud and there's this motherfucker with a bird and i'm bird, not even bird, sure bird. <laughs> and, bird, bird, bird. and i just remember like not digging it and i didn't really become a big wwe watcher because i have some holes in my watching because when i went to college from 95 to 2000 yes it took five years kiss my ass uh, I didn't have money, so I didn't have cable, so <laughs> I didn't watch wrestling. Free zone, Judge Shoot, free man, I was man, I was so poor in college. Uh, Dude. but I didn't really start watching WWF like seriously until like my senior year of college, like ninety nine. My my first senior year in college in like ninety nine, ninety eight, around in that era. So the, Vince McMahon was just a cheesy announcer to me. I knew that Hulk Hogan was the biggest thing. I can tell you that. Before I got into watching WWE, the product, I watched more of that Saturday morning cartoon. That's how I knew about WWE was Rowdy Roddy Piper and Big John Studd from the cartoon. So I thought, you know, I was only seven, eight or nine. And maybe back then I was a smart mark. I just thought it looked too fake. It was like so lit. It was like pr pretty. And like NWA shows were grimy yeah. and They're gritty great. and bloody yeah. and headshots and, <clears throat> and, and, Magnum TA trying to stab Tully Blanchard in the eyeball with a shard of wood. And then so, there's just this bird. But later on, I come to find out <laughs> that, man, here's the thing about, about Vinny Mac. I thought that the three things that were inevitable in this world was death, taxes, and Vince McMahon. And it you just knew it was going to be like this. I know we're skipping ahead, but we're, you knew that it was going to go like this. It wasn't going to be like Vinnie Mac stepped out on top. Something skeezy and gross was going to happen to facilitate him getting, you know, basically fired. He got fired. Let's be honest. He retired. They fired him. Well, you know, the both of you, Vince McMahon was not a part of your come up in wrestling for me. My first experience with professional wrestling started around the time of WrestleMania four with the tournament and seeing Hulk. My actually my first real introduction to Hulk Hogan was him doing a heel thing, like hitting uh, the million dollar man with a chair so that macho man can win the world title at WrestleMania. So <laughs> then I started getting into, you know, the stuff that happened before with Andre and Hogan, but, uh, but that's really my, my first part of, of being a wrestling fan. And I can remember my cousin coming to me and saying, Oh, you watch WWF. I don't watch that stuff. That stuff's cartoon. I watch WCW. Mm. And I was like, what's WCW. And he showed <laughs> me. And that was my introdu introduction to 1990 WCW. And I absolutely loved it too. Hey, how old that's... were you right? How old were you right there? Rez? I was about nine, nine okay. years old. I, well, uh, see, and, and I think that's interesting. I was 10. Eight. When I watched One Man Gang Ronnie Garvin fight Ricky Starr in ICW for that belt right there. Derek, how old did you say you were? I've literally watched since birth. My dad was 16 when he had me. He was a huge wrestling fan in 89. I, I know nothing other than professional wrestling. <laughs> That's why he is the human wrestling He's encyclopedia. The human wrestling encyclopedia since birth. And he's only 33 years old now. Rez was about nine. St Steve Barker, how old were you? Did you uh, say? I was uh, born in 77, and I can remember 1985 wrestling. I can remember. There, you were eight. Made. And so last, certainly not least, the greatest announcer in wrestling today, bar none. I don't care who you are. I don't care what promotion you're in. Adam Harris is the best announcer in the sport of professional wrestling today. Adam, how old were you? when you started being a wrestling fan. Well, and it has everything to do with how old I was when I started watching wrestling. I was with you guys like nine years old. It was 1991, you know, and it was all American wrestling. You know, we got cable when I was nine years old and we got home from church in time enough for me to turn on all American wrestling. 
Uh, you know, and Sunday McMahon is on noon was a special time. Wasn't oh, it? it was incredible. No, it was incredible. And all and, American wrestling was my church on Sunday. That's absolutely, the absolutely. <laughs> you know, we all went through the motions on Sunday morning so we could get to noon. Uh, for for and at that time it was Vince and Bobby Heenan, I think, uh, uh, doing that. But the first match I remember was Jake the Snake Roberts. Was it wasn't even a match. It was earthquake squashing Damien and and McMahon oh. is going. Don't do it. No, don't do it. You know, and I was hooked. I mean, any wonder like as you're a kid, nine years old watching that it was it was traumatic, but in like, I guess, a pretty uh, effective way because it hooked me. Sure. The same way that a coconut from Roddy Piper upside of Jimmy Superfly Snuka's head was traumatic, you know, or Snuka losing the title match and jumping on uh, Morocco, you know, uh, just gorgeous, gorgeous stuff in the 80s. While at the same time, to Barker's point, the dichotomy of all of it is all of it coming out now is it around that same time when all of us, Jimmy Snuka, arguably the most popular wrestler in the world, even when Hogan was at his zenith, allegations of a man sweeping a murder under <laughs> the rug. So dark. There's so much I, I darkness mean, behind WWE. Right. I, I, I mean, you know, you, you've got to contrast those two things. You're listening to Jimmy Superfly Snuka in a cartoon on Saturday mornings and doing this and the crowd going wild. Yeah, he may have, may have, he was alleged to have killed his girlfriend in New Jersey. And McMahon covered it up. So doggone it, guys. Well, you know, uh, we're going down a lot of rabbit holes here, and the, and the only rabbit, the only rabbit hole we really need to go down is the future of the WWE because the, this uh, when I heard well, first of all, let's let's talk about the the stage of events here. You got Vince McMahon retiring, John Laurinaitis gets fired, Bruce Pritchard gets elevated to head of creative, Triple H comes back, he becomes the executive vice president of talent relations, and then we have a weekend. And the weekend goes by. And then Monday morning, it's announced that Bruce Pritchard is no longer head of creative and Triple H is head of creative. So that means Monday morning, as Raw is being booked, Triple H is now in charge. And from what I understand, the locker room is thrilled, all except for Brock Lesnar, who uh, who actually walked out of SmackDown um, after the... Uh, after the announcement, he walks out of SmackDown and, and they ended up talking him back in the building. Not sure how they did that. I'm sure it was uh, adding a couple zeros to his check, but, uh, <laughs> but he came back and he saved us from Oldberg, who was going to take <laughs> his place. We were going to see Goldberg again come back. And, uh, and luckily, we didn't have to go through with that because Brock came back, but he was upset. I wonder why. He would be upset. Is there heat there between him and Triple H? I think that he is just loyal. I think he's just loyal. And and you've got to figure the only person that has ever dealt with Brock Lesnar is Vince McMahon. John Laurinaitis ain't going to talk to him. He ain't being talked to by a bunch of stupid writers. It's Vince McMahon and him. And I think it really goes to, and this is something that you hear from Stone Cold Steve Austin, Mick Foley, Undertaker a little bit. Benny Mac had a very fatherly relationship with a lot of these wrestlers. And there's a lot of people like dude, Chris Jericho is way far out of WWE and probably has done so much to his career that he may never come back. He never talks bad about Vince McMahon. No, I think it really comes down to loyalty. I think it was a loyalty move and he's an emotional beast. Let's be honest. He's an emotional beast. We know that he was a handful to deal with in the UFC, right? So, I mean, that, that, that reputation follows him everywhere. Right. You know, I think he's just kind of a handful to deal with. He knows he's a draw. He knows that he can do whatever the hell he wants to. And it's all because of any Mac daddy's gone. Yeah. That's uh, that's true. Well, we also hear about the possibility of Sasha Banks returning and Naomi now that Vince McMahon is gone. That's a bad uh, look. Do you think we're going to see that happen? I do. It, it will. And, and I think for several reasons. Number one, I think the young ladies are talented. And 
I think that at this time right now, um, number one, they hold the power. Number two, um, from a diversity standpoint, and I know they've got Bianca, I know they have Tamina Snuka, I know they have other wrestlers, female wrestlers of color, one a world champion right now, but it would not hurt the WWE to have another couple of prominently featured uh, African-American females on their program. When you, when you speak of it from a, uh, a place of diversity, I am speaking of it from a place of reality. And I believe Naomi is thrilled that she actually has a door open to come back. I was about to say Sasha Banks has something to, she has something she can stand on. Dude, Naomi's there because she's married to a guy. Yeah, she, and, and dude, she's a great athlete. She just can't get over. I can't believe that she walked out to begin with because, you know, Sasha can walk out and go straight to AEW. She can 100% do that. She can go straight to Impact. She can go straight to ROH. She can go straight to New Japan. She can go and do whatever she wants. She could probably do movies. I mean, she could come out with her own pop album if she wanted to. Sasha Banks has the star power. They only followed Sasha Banks, and I guarantee you that Sasha Banks ain't going to see to it that she gets another opportunity. Sasha Banks ain't going to pull her up. She doesn't. She she walked out with Sasha Banks, but she didn't have the power of Sasha Banks. And now she's probably regretting her decision. And now she's seeing this as an opportunity. Oh, I can come back and, and still save face because Vince is not there. And and I I don't know if uh, if she'll be welcome with open arms, but I would hope so. And, before uh, before Derek has to go, I got to get your take on this. As the resident AEW uh, connoisseur, how crazy over would Mercedes, what's Sasha Banks' real name? Mercedes something. How Renato. How crazy over if she rolls into Rampage? Oh. I mean, that, that's, that's headlines across any news platform. Is that CM Punk size? No. No. Absolutely not. No. For female. No, no, but you can't, it, you can't it would, ruin CM Punk, but you can ruin I mean, Sasha Banks. It, it's big. Uh, it would be a big deal. That's it's, a good point, it's, it's as big as when Moxley jumped, but it's not as big as Punk. Okay. You know, the, the only person that would be as big as Punk would be Charlotte Flair. She's the only person that could jump ship like that and go to AEW and it'd be as big as Punk. And it, she's the greatest would, female wrestler of all time. Yeah, she is. Even though Derek doesn't think so, but I uh, can't do Derek. You know so much about wrestling. Explain yourself and do not. And when you explain this, don't bring up her bad. A couple times she's done the dive badly. How is <laughs> Charlotte Flair not the greatest by like five spots? So you say the greatest female wrestler. If you want to yes. say the greatest entertainer on WWE television, I'll go with it. But she is not the greatest female wrestler. She, Who watch, is? watch her matches. Really watch her matches. And then go, especially the matches where they're like, this person botched and this person botched and this person botched and this person botched. They're all in a match with Charlotte and Charlotte's not going to take the heat on it. So they got to put it on the other person. So who is? Who is? Who's better than Charlotte? Female wrestler? Yep. All time? No. It's right now active currently probably nobody okay. okay so then you agree charlotte is the, okay all <laughs> it's right the so goat. We can move on. Here, here's where we really are guys and, and i'm going to go ar- around the uh, the panel here and we'll start with adam harris adam what do you think triple h is going to bring to the table in the creative department are we going to see a lot of change are we going to see them stop changing people's names than when they're already over are we going to see the colors go away from NXT and go back to the black and gold. What do you think is going to be the biggest thing that we see from Triple H being head of creative? I think it's going to take some time. I saw some talk that, oh, last night's Raw was totally different. I don't think so. There were some longer matches, but I think they do that when it's the go-home show anyway. Like, they put a few really long matches in so you can just insert the promos and get on with it. You didn't think uh, that it felt like a go- – like, it didn't – I feel like we have not – felt a real go home episode. It felt like a go home show. No, absolutely. Time. No, absolutely. I think that's true. I think that's true. Um I do it think it made me true. want to watch SummerSlam. Me too. 
Yeah, me too. Me too. I do think that's true. But, you know, I don't know if that has anything to do with Triple H or not. I mean, let's be honest, guys. I mean, he's still landing. He's still got to, you know, he can't just insert himself into any of these storylines. And as we talked about in our SummerSlam preview, uh, if Triple H had his way, you know, Champa wouldn't be doing the Miz's bidding. But, you know, he can't just jump in and change that. So, you know, let's get this over with. Let's get through SummerSlam. And I think Monday uh, after SummerSlam is when we might start seeing some drastic uh, changes. And that's the time to debut like a Sasha or or bring somebody back, uh, you know, that that would make a big impact. And, and Triple H can take credit for it. I, I would agree with you. And, and I would I would say that it, if I was Triple H, I think I would have done it a little bit differently. I think I would have started Raw with Triple H in the middle of the mm-hmm. ring and all the superstars around the ring. I think I would have started it like like a reset. Yeah, but remember when they did that last time and Steph and Vince and Triple H were in the ring and they said, we're going to start listening to you, the fans. It didn't go so good. And then they didn't listen to a damn thing. Then they didn't listen to anything. Right. So, Oh, that's true. That was Uh, December of 19 that they said that. Well, Derek, Derek, uh, what do you think that Triple H is going to add to the WWE? So I I do think that the storylines are going to increase dramatically, and I think it's going to be a more realism program. Now, Adam, you said that you don't think that he had as much to do with it, but... Let's be honest, how Triple H has probably had his hand in creative all along, but he still had to have that buffer through Vince that may have turned things down or turned them off or turned them away at the last minute. And Monday could have been the first example of that is here's the ideas I've been trying to push for a while. Let's just go ahead and go with them because nobody else can tell me no right now. So it may have made that go home show feel so much better. I don't think he's going to take it back to the black and gold brand. I think they'll keep the color scheme a little while. I don't think NXT is going to be um, the the major changing platform. However, I do feel like the people on the Raw brand and the SmackDown brand that have that star power that he was grooming and, and training and developing in the NXT program are going to have a more prominent role again. I think they're, you know, we talk about Ciampa being Miz's, you know, side piece. I don't know if you guys saw the promo that he cut on WWE. I think it was .com promo that Ciampa cut for Miz. Look it up. It's fantastic. Um, they're, they're questioning Miz, and Miz never says a word. Ciampa takes the mic and completely just cuts an amazing promo. It did not look like it was something completely scripted it looked like triple h said here's some bullet points do what you do best good but an amazing promo because that's what champa does he's yes. great yeah he's, he's a great such, professional wrestler such a good stick man and you could feel just passion come out of this promo and i haven't seen that from him in quite some time um so look it up if you haven't seen it. it's great i think things like that is what triple h is going to allow more it's he's going to allow these guys to do what they do because that's why they brought them into the WWE. You know, we talk about the machine that the people that WWE has developed, and those are the only ones getting put over. But, you know, at one time they were reaching out to all these indie promotions and saying, hey, I want your top guys, bring them in. I'm going to make sure they are prominently featured on a program to make them very successful and very rich. And they did that for a little while through NXT, and it was amazing. The, the origination of the black and gold brand was fantastic. The matches with Sami Zayn and Neville and all these guys – it was an amazing product. There wasn't a bunch of BS going on. Um, promos were limited. There wasn't a bunch of stuff going on in the as far as like backstage scenes and, and interviews and things like that. It was strictly lay out the program that you're wanting to do, tell your story, get in the ring, continue your story, and sell tickets. And they were doing that. And I think Triple H will allow the main roster to do that more. And it will become more of what it used to be in, you know, when we talk about the Attitude Era, when things felt real. And I think he will attribute to that. All right, Matt Mullins has joined the broadcast. Hello, Mr. Mullins. And I am going to just go straight. Tag in, Matt. We cannot hear you, Matt. Oh. Oh, we've got you now. Okay. So I'm going to go to you on the panel now, and we will uh, ask you, what do you think that Triple H is going to add being head of creative of the WWE. Fucking wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, collar and elbow tie up. There you go. Somebody's yeah. getting an arm bar put on them, folks. Work a headlock for two minutes and, and draw the crowd in. <laughs> 
comes back and gives the list. Armbar. <laughs> uh, man, I'm excited. I think it's an exciting time to be a wrestling fan, to be a toy collector. We're getting we're getting all this shit right at the. I mean, I yeah. love. It. Is he like, waiting to get the Triple H, the Booker fig? Is that what you're looking for? I'm just. Is it I don't know. Another figure. He's got a pencil and a shovel. Man, the shit about the Power Town figures, I just can't get over. Um, they're the Power Town figures make are, are what I love about wrestling. That's a different episode. That's a different episode. I know, yeah, I, know but, episode. But I think you plugged into the wrong the wrong <laughs> show. We're talking about the biggest topic in professional wrestling right hey, now. Hey, Myers and Cardona are over there. Yeah, that's that that way. That way. This is the house of gay thing. Yeah, you you were you thought you were on the major figure podcast or something. <laughs> we're, we're talking about. Uh, <laughs> We we'll are get there, Matt. We got figures and birds. We're bringing to WrestleCade. We promise, folks. We've got plans. <laughs> yes, yes, we do. Stephen P. Steve, New. Steve, why are you sounding like Terry Funk, baby? Uh, hey, it's Johnny Junior. Ace impression. I thought it was John Laurinaitis as a guest on the House of Cafe. <laughs> That's right, Junior. I think they robbed the box office again. <laughs> <laughs> the horse is feeling bad. All right, boys, gotta go. Okay, let's yeah. see you, Derek Jones. Derek right, Jones, Derek Jones is leaving us. Someone about a horse. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, Terry P. New, uh, we I want I want to hear your opinion. All um, right, Reznor. What? Oh no! Oh, oh no! Oh, He's oh, getting no. wild. All right. So, uh, what do you think Triple H is going to add to, uh, <laughs> to the WWE as the head of creative? Whatever Nick Khan tells him he can. Oh, we haven't oh. talked about that. Uh, we'll see. I wonder if Nick Khan's uh, uh, even going to uh, have his uh, 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 <laughs> For a loop on that one, didn't a Reznor? Is Nick Khan <laughs> going to keep uh, his job? Yeah. So if so. Nick Khan's smart, he'll run the business. And he won't care what Hunter's doing on the creative side. If they're smart, Nick Khan... We'll keep working that Dwayne The Rock Johnson angle and the John Cena angle and the NBC Universal angle and sure. try, you know, to have that stock, stock price go up all while they're dealing with the shit mess, which is Vince McMahon's legal troubles. Uh, okay, so uh, here's a good question for you. You got Nick Khan. All right. did it, w When he was making the cuts, he was cutting things left and right. He was he was cutting people. And then we seen a bunch of big changes to NXT. It, does Triple H still harbor ill will over what happened with NXT? And is that on the shoulders of Nick Khan? I believe if he's got the book, no problem. I, I think that so long as he's got the book, he's got his slice of power and nobody steps over the line. I think, I think that Triple H is fine. With that, I think only when Nick Khan would try to start blurring the lines, coming over, you know, telling him USA doesn't like this or Fox doesn't like this or the Saudis don't like this, then I think that's when Triple H might think he's getting bossed around. But I think as long as Triple H has got the book, Triple H has got Stephanie in the front office, co CEO with Nick Khan, so he knows what's going on over there. His wife's telling him what's going on in the front office. Uh, I think Triple will be just fine. Well, it's an interesting time for professional wrestling, that is for sure, because we are seeing the possibility of all types uh, of different things that could happen. And it's it, like Matt said, it's an exciting time to be a wrestling fan. Um, Matt, you you were having some internet issues, so we kind of we kind of moved moved past you there for a second. You look to be all uh, all good to go now. Um, what what were your initial thoughts when uh, when you heard that Triple H was the, uh, the the head of creative? Excited because I love that moment. I love those NXT years when Triple H was really using it as developmental, and it felt like a territory in itself. Uh, that's my shit. So yeah. I'm. Excited to see wh what kind of reins he gives Paul Heyman. <laughs> that's what I'm really excited for. Oh, that'd be good. That's cool. I like that idea. What are uh, what are you implying, sir? What do you think's going to happen? I 
Well, I'm just saying, I know that they didn't get along, Stephanie and Paul, but SmackDown was the best ever when Paul Heyman had it. So your your show has suffered since then, since the Paul Heyman regime of SmackDown. Give it back to him. Let's see what he does. He also had Kurt Angle and Eddie Guerrero. And and Edge. Edge. Yeah, yeah, that's true. true. Yeah, but man, this is one thing that Brian uh, Brian Alvarez says all the time. He's one of my few – I think he's the only good wrestling uh, journalist that you should really be listening to. And I know he's in cahoots with Dave Meltzer, but he's got his shit together. He says regularly that right now WWE has more talent than it has ever had ever. Now, they don't have Stone Cold, they don't have Rock, they don't have The Undertaker. But from top to bottom, they have the most talent than they've ever had as a business. Do you all agree? Yeah, I would totally agree with that. One thing. One interesting thing that uh, that I wanted to bring up about what you know, you, you mentioned Paul Heyman, and it just so happens that Paul Heyman and Roman Reigns are the only two people that kind of made reference to the fact that something had happened. Uh, Paul Heyman, uh, you know, he, he said on Raw the, that uh, you know the, oh, the, the, the sound, sound guy, guy. You're the next yeah. one out of here. You're the next one out the door. The sound guy, Loved he's gonna be right there with Vince. Huge and then pop. Roman Reigns, he says, "Yeah, your daddy's not here anymore, boy." And and that's uh, that. Those are the two, the the two sentences that kind of popped the people that know the inside. Now I'm sure there were some kids that were like, "What is that? Uh, what what?" But oh, and Heyman sold it too. Did you see him? He was like. Mm-hmm. Can't yeah. believe you just said that. Can't believe you uh, just said that. And Paul's perfect. Paul and Paul's facials, everything that Paul does is perfect to me. Top yep. guy. Yep. Yeah. If you you could not be a fan, like you said, Stephanie McMahon's not a fan of Paul. They they have their own issues, but you can't be someone who's been around professional wrestling as long as Stephanie McMahon and not know that Paul's gold. I think, yeah. I, I think that there were, they just had issues from just listening to the, you know, the Bruce. Uh, something to wrestle with podcast. Th- those are really interesting uh, shows where he talks about the behind the scenes of Paul and Stephanie. Back now, there. when you said earlier about NXT going to the all those stupid collars and stuff, that didn't really have anything to do with Nick Khan. Wasn't that pretty agreed upon that that was Bruce Pritchard taking over NXT? I don't think Nick Khan has. We've not really heard anything. And, you know, I stay plugged into the rumor mill and I have Derek Jones as a friend. So I hear all the fucking. Uh, uh, rumors and innuendo, but that was pretty much Bruce Pritchard's thing. And I remember if you go back to when we were still a podcast before we had the YouTube channel, we did an episode where we reviewed NXT 2.0 and all of us had agreed that this was Bruce Pritchard bullshit. Okay. Like soap that, opera garbage. That brings up a really good point. So where does this leave Bruce Pritchard? A podcast hosting so he's not going to have a job anymore, you don't the think? The rumor mill says that him and Triple H don't get along. Interesting. Interesting. Very I interesting. I find that hard to believe just because they're both such Vince guys. You know what I mean? I just feel like they both know how Triple to do with Vince Triple H is a Vince so guy because it's his father-in-law. And Triple H might be the greatest worker of all time. <laughs> I don't believe he loves Stephanie McMahon. I think those were anchor babies. That motherfucker has Ouch. always been accusations. That man has been the Shots biggest politician fired. in the back uh, in the back of the room. Him and Shawn Michaels being I, their little political selves, and this guy plays a long game, son. I like, agree. dude. I agree. Do you agree? <laughs> I agree and disagree. And the reason why, okay, so so I do agree that Triple H is the best worker in the business. I, I 100% believe that. However, I do not believe. You think their love's a shoot? I do not. I, I do believe that their love is a shoot, and I'll tell you why. The reason why I believe that Triple H loves Stephanie McMahon because Stephanie McMahon and Triple H are one in the same. And, and I, I come to believe that it maybe I'm creating conspiracy theory right now, but it's pretty interesting that Triple H was ousted pretty much from the WWE. And then all of a sudden the, the walls start crumbling down and who's there when the smoke clears Triple H and Stephanie. He had a heart <laughs> issue. I don't think he was like well, pushed away. Here's the thing. So I'm going to be interesting, uh, interested to see in the legal cases, 
how much distance and how much disavowing of any knowledge Triple H, Stephanie, Nick Khan. You know, Nick Khan's late to the party, so he can probably legit say, oh, I never knew he was a pervert and was paying secretaries $200,000 a year, uh, you know, out of the company till or whatever. I wasn't even there. Wait a minute. You guys, so so here's a question for you. I wasn't even there. How? how <laughs> it was Owen. <laughs> yeah. How could, uh, man. When you think about it, you said you're, you're going to say, did, did Paul or well, did Triple H, did Triple H not know he spent all this time with Vince McMahon? Did Stephanie McMahon not know she spent all this time with Vince McMahon? I can't say that I didn't know. I fucking knew. You knew. You knew everybody in this. <laughs> I just thing. didn't know who. Like yeah. I said, when, but we when all I watched knew him, he was a pervert. We, when I, I mean, watched him assume the quarterback position with Trish Stat Stratus, I knew all that I needed to know. How many times have we seen this man's ass? When a bunch, but right. he made Trish Stratus bark like a dog on national TV, the number one show on cable. That's all I needed to see. Well, and you know, here's a question: If you could make trip, or if you could make Trish Stratus bark like a dog on national TV, wouldn't you do it? Don't make no. me doubt that. Don't doubt for a second. I couldn't. No. Oh. Ah, yeah. Okay. Hey, can we all because we know Vince hey, McMahon. Rich, I tell you what. <laughs> oh my God. Oh my Jesus Christ. We're going to get a cop. We're going to get a strike. YouTube strike. Oh man. <laughs> sorry, YouTube. Carolyn bye Wozniacki. Bye. We're sorry. This has been the last episode of House of Gay Fable on YouTube. You see this, what this is doing to wrestling fans? I mean, look, look at Stephen P. New. He's an absolute That's right. mess. Can you blur the Stephen P. News? Blur the <laughs> Stephen P. Sex. <laughs> but now I have to blur that like they used to McMahon's ass on Monday Night Raw. Hey, now I'm glad right. we're back to talking Wait, about Vince no. because this is kind of the going away Vince party. Uh, we know what those girls look like. Oh, they all on. kind of hold look on like Sable, Tori. They were all blonde hair, blue eyed. Every one of those women are a Sable type. You okay. know it. I, I, I'm sure that they are. I hope one of them's do drop, but I, I've got to say <laughs> this. I have to say this. If you are listening to the podcast on Spotify or on Apple podcast or any of the various platforms that we're available on, and you've been listening to the last, uh, I don't know, four to five minutes and, and you are like, why are all these noises happening? And what are they, what are they doing? You would have to check us out on YouTube. You can uh, go to YouTube and, and look up superior radio network. We are there and you can find the podcast and you can see Stephen P news nipples. If that's what you wanted to see tonight, you can see it. All you have to do is log on to YouTube, make sure you hit subscribe. And if you hit subscribe and you hit the little bell, you will also get nipple notifications right here. Yeah. From the house of K Fave. You get try, your money's worth. Let me you try to get, get this back on the tr on on the rails. Brian Resner, no one you always have to do the you know, be the MC here. I want you to tell me, is Vince McMahon, I've been thinking about this a lot since he retired, is he a net negative or a net positive for the state, not for wrestling, but for the state of wrestling right now? Is he a net positive? I would or a say a net yes. negative. I would say he's a net positive because he is the reason why I'm a wrestling fan. Um, he created the things that, uh, that I didn't make say all that. I'm talking about right now. What do you mean? Right, right now he's retired. <laughs> I'm is saying that like we have spent two years on YouTube bitching about raw and SmackDown and okay. we have to write. Have we not? And we've all said WrestleMania yeah. was good. And there's been a few pay-per-views here and there, but as a, as a whole, as an average, we none of us has like W. Dude, how many times has Stephen P. New been in our chat room and just been like, I'm about done with watching wrestling on yep. a Monday? Uh, right he, now, is he a net negative? Because it's bringing up, because I want to hear what your thoughts about Triple H. Was WWE dying under Vince McMahon except for Roman Reigns? Um, yes. Yes, he was. He was killing it. I think Vince, when he was connected as a younger man, into society it was the product was better as we i mean we you know as we're in the 20 what 2012 to current vince was so disconnected that every time that vince put that bullshit out we just called it we're like man i would rather watch anything remember otis puked a few <laughs> weeks ago 
That's Vince. You know, yes, exactly. That's a great point. And I was going to say, you know, the back when Vince was in touch, sadly, that was also the Girls Gone Wild era uh, of, yeah. of media. Yeah. So, and I just want to say something real quick, like, don't condone any of this behavior. You know, obviously Vince is a pervert. I don't think that makes us all, we don't have to account for this as wrestling fans. Like we've been wrestling fans regardless, but I'm surprised. And I think you guys will probably all agree. But as soon as the Harvey Weinstein thing started happening, I thought Vince's names were numbered. And this has lasted, he lasted way longer than I thought. I thought for sure something with all the people who were taking falls in the media, mass media, Mass media. People more powerful than Vince McMahon. Way more powerful than Vince McMahon. Like, how did he make it this long? Well, the question is, is how powerful. Are they really? Is Harvey Weinstein or was Harvey Weinstein or Bill Cosby more powerful? I don't think so. Harvey Weinstein was. I think Harvey, Vin- you know all those Harvey Quentin Weinstein Tarantino was- movies you like? That's yeah. Harvey Weinstein. He, all those Kevin a- Smith movies? That's Harvey Weinstein. He wasn't a billionaire, I don't believe, Steve. But I'm talking about power in culture. Like every time that Quentin Tarantino, dude, just go watch the Oscars over the last 20 years. Something really quick to everyone here, which I don't have to explain it to Stephen P. New, but I have to explain it to everyone here and everyone listening that if you have a billion fucking dollars, you're more powerful than anyone that doesn't. Here's the thing. That's not true because the president doesn't have a billion dollars and he has way more power than anybody. So that's not right. Doesn't work that way. No, because if you can shape culture, that's more valuable than money. If you have a billion dollars, you helped get the president elected. Yeah. Comparing (laughs) apples to apples, though, if you go entertainment guy, billionaire versus entertainment guy whose net worth is 300 million bucks, I'm afraid I got to agree with Rez. Those two guys aren't in the same league. In terms of influence, I don't believe. No, I, man, not. y'all are being too much, too many marks. I think, I think Dude, is- he made Pulp Fiction, people. He I changed understand. movies. <laughs> what are we talking about? Wait, I'm wait, a mark, wait. but when you all are too markish. When, when he changed movies, did he change his wallet to a billion dollars? Because if he didn't, I don't give a fuck. The, billion, <sighs> the billionaire, the billionaire is always going to be more powerful than the non Not true, not in culture. Dude, there's a reason why Twitter's not worth dick, but it's the most valuable thing out there because it shapes culture. Now, Vince shapes our culture because we're marks. You all are ridiculous right now. We're talking about, dude, the Oscars. Go watch the Oscars over the last two decades and watch every girl who fucking knew, by the way, that Harvey Weinstein was a fucking creep. Thank him for her success. All of them. They all did. Dude, just just the Quentin Tarantino movies alone changed culture because Quentin Tarantino is not a billionaire, but he's more powerful in the culture, people. Brian, you just like money, and I do too, but you're being fucking ridiculous. <laughs> I'm telling you right now, the guy had more power. I, I, don't, I don't even understand how you could even. I, Matt I, fell asleep. He literally had his wife in the White House. Like He, he definitely was. All kinds he, of billionaires have had their wives in the fucking White House. But not the head of the Small Business Administration. I mean, Brian has a pretty good point. Ironic. The fucking family that destroyed how many small businesses was now the administrator of the Small Business Bureau. Well, well, that's what happens when you're a super powerful billionaire. You ain't too powerful for the SEC, Jack. You can say that all you want to, but he ain't that fucking powerful. I honestly... um, Even Marker said he about to F around and find out. Yeah, he oh, is. You know, speaking of people who are going to f around and find out, let's talk about Kevin Dunn. Kevin <laughs> yeah. Dunn, uh, uh, Bucky out. Beaver, as they call him, um, <laughs> is looking like he might go to prison for insider trading. What do you think about that, Steve? New, tell us what the SEC is. Well, that would be the Securities and Exchange Commission. And if you are dumping large volumes of stock based on information which is not yet publicly available, you might be found guilty in a court of law by 12 jurors of your peers of the crime of insider trading. Ask Martha Uh, Stewart. And you're you're actually facing 20 years at that point, correct? Yeah, 20 20 years, uh, probably some time off for no priors, good behavior. 
Now, and Adam, also, you're the one that bitches the most about all the cuts and just the bad directing. Is 20 years in prison enough for what uh, he's done? Oh, <laughs> for for what I've sat through every Monday night in my entire adult years. life? No, it's not. It should be more. <laughs> I, hope cuts, like, I hope Cornette. I hope before the punch even lands. <laughs> yeah. So I, uh, I mean, or here's the way this works. Now they messed it up in the steroid trial, but. If you've got Bucky Beaver and a few others that are pinched on charges of insider trading, do they roll on McMahon for some kind of favorable testimony in exchange for a substantial compliance motion roll to the McMahon government? For what? Roll on McMahon for what? Anything they know. Anything they know. Or does that help get McMahon off? Tax, tax evasion, uh, insider trading. Look, if man, they, I talked about this on another round. If they snitch around and put a 77 year old man named Vince McMahon in prison, I am going to be so pissed off. Look, but, I'm oh, telling you, you, are you telling me that wait. you don't think Kevin Dunn's the kind of guy that squeals wait. like the bird man of Alcatraz on oh. Vince McMahon to save himself? Hell yes, he's that kind of guy. Wait, wait, now wait a minute. Who are, who are we kidding here? We just had a conversation about being a billionaire. If you're a billionaire and someone's going to roll over on you, don't you end up committing suicide by being thrown off a building into traffic? Or Isn't that what happens? That's only if you work for the Clintons. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> I'll tell you this. There's one thing I do know. You don't see a lot of billionaires in prison. Why? Because they're very powerful people. Uh, man, is there, Steve, what do you I'm think? Not dis I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just saying that if I'm Kevin Dunn's lawyer and I, and you know, without telling me he's guilty, I know he's guilty uh, in a little bit of criminal work that I've done. The first thing I do is I'm running to the prosecutor and say, let's cut a deal. Mm. Wow. Early. And look, I'll wire my guy up. I, you, you know, I, I said this, I, I said this on an earlier podcast. I think it was me and Adam and maybe Derek. Uh, it was a documentary, one of those millions of documentaries that is on the network. And it was during the steroid trial. And Stephanie McMahon told the story about him coming to her as a little girl and being like, hey, you know, you're going to hear some bad stuff about daddy in the press. And Stephanie McMahon, as an adult, said, you know, I didn't know what to really think, but, you know, my dad's not a moral man. That's his daughter saying that about him. Would you want your kids saying that they knew you're not a moral man? Like, Steve, do you think that there's like there's anyone left in the government? And I know it was a long time ago. That's just like, you know what? He got us on the steroid trial. We're going to get him this time. There, There is some old unretired DOJ lawyer who's like, yep, you got us. We got you now. Wow. Cause wow. and a, a secondary question, Stephen P. New, who would you rather have on your ass, the SEC or the IRS? Uh, oh, uh, the SEC. R you they, rather they make, have them? They make deals with too big to fail and Enron and mm. guys like that all the time. Mm. If the IRS has got you in their crosshairs, but it, you can't answer that just in a vacuum. It's like everything else in law school. It, it depends. It depends. It depends. So if the SEC's got the stronger case, the IRS will back off. If the IRS has got the stronger case, and here I think the SEC probably has the stronger case of making misrepresentations in 10K filings. In reports. In reports that they've got to file uh, every month or every quarter of uh, insider trading you know, stock inflation, stock deflation, uh, stock manipulation, all of that are crimes under the Securities and Exchange Commission. And if the SEC has got the stronger case, I'm more afraid of them as a lawyer than I am the IRS necessarily. But but it, it would have to, it's a matter of degree, Steve. Matt? I, would, I would think that part of the reason that it took so long for Vince uh caught up in it is Vince is pretty right up in your face with hey here's nudie girls here's <laughs> that's, I mean Vince is doing it right in your face so it's it's a lot easier to think well he's not doing that whereas Bill Cosby was hiding it 
and they, you know, they, when those girls came forward, it was more of a shock. It's not as much of a shock because that's what Vince is, has made a billion dollars doing, but it is strange. That's, that's a strange way to hide in plain sight. In plain sight is Vince McMahon. That's, Mer- the, that's the America. Dark, I mean, dark side of the ring episode. hiding in plain sight, Vince McMahon. That's a good, that's a good worker. He's a good fucking worker. Well, I hope they do not get him because I do not want to see Vince McMahon go to jail. I don't even want to see him go on trial. I uh, I would think that the the media would turn it into an absolute circus. Actually, wow. second thought, it may be very entertaining, so we may want to watch it. That'll make it a lot of content for us, fellas. <laughs> it would definitely make a lot of content for the House of Cape Fabe, and I'd we make- are always here to provide you with the content that uh, that, that 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 you're looking for, which is uh, right now this topic and we have been sitting here for almost an hour and i have to say that uh, that we have covered a good bit and i'd say this is not our last time talking about triple h being in control of the wwe but uh, we are pretty hopeful i would say all of us seem to be in a positive thought process going forward and like you said it's an exciting time to be a wrestling fan and we are glad to be wrestling fans with you for Steven Barker, Matt Mullen, Steven P new and Adam Harris. We are the house of kayfabe. Make sure that you hit subscribe, click the bell to get your notifications, subscribe on Spotify, subscribe on Apple, subscribe anywhere. You can find us pod bean um, anchor, wherever you listen to podcasts, we are there. So make sure you subscribe and make sure you check out our YouTube because you can see Steven P Nunes nipples. It, it can happen. You can see it and it's only a, available on- uh, but then again who hasn't you know <laughs> <laughs> college and law school were really really i need fun. to talk to hr after this podcast <laughs> yeah he showed us his nipples so we were trying to steve new what steve new don't know he just paid all of us son we're all gonna have ndas after this podcast yeah. i am waiting my hush money payment <laughs> as we speak waiting for the um, hit the account here yeah, <laughs> all, all you guys will be paid wrestlecade weekend which by the way <laughs> we've got a great table Reznor and I are working on what the wall is going to look like. All the guests, it's going to all the merch. Can you give us? Can we tell everyone that's going to be at our beautifully adorned table? Yes, go ahead, Stephen P. New. Let us know who uh, who is going to be at the House of Kayfabe table this year at Wrestlecade. Well, doggone it, we've got uh, Myers and Cardona, Francine, Davy Richards. Who else is Gary announced Adam? We got Aubrey, some- Aubrey Ed- or Aubrey, um, yeah, Aubrey, Aubrey Edwards. Edwards. A certain Claudio. individual who just won the Ring of Honor World Heavyweight Claudio Championship. Claudio Castagnoli, thank you. Man, yes. I can't wait to see that line. ROH World Champion Claudio will be at the House of Kayfabe All-Star Wrestling Wall at WrestleCade the weekend after Thanksgiving. It's always a great time be there with the brothers here and uh, just having an absolute, it's a weekend immersion in pro wrestling. And not to mention, it will be the return of franchised with Shane Douglas live at WrestleCade. I will, uh, we'll have Shane and some guests on the podcast, which will be live in front of a studio audience. And we cannot wait to be live in front of a studio audience again. If you would like to see a preview of what it may be like, you can check out, the TNA Early Years panel, which is available on YouTube right now, it is not available on any of the podcast streams. It is a YouTube exclusive, and you can see us talk to Jeff Jarrett, D'Lo Brown, um, Johnny James Swinger, Storm, James Storm, Wildcat, Wildcat, Chris Harris, Goldilocks, um, yes. uh, uh, Bill Barons, which uh, gives us a great story with a special surprise appearance from Earl Hebner. It's all available on the Run in. stream. Make sure you check out Superior Radio Network on YouTube. One other thing, Reznor, I promised Bobby Fulton of the Fantastics and Dylan Hines that I would sponsor one of their people that they're having uh, at the Big Time Wrestling table. That individual just happens to be one Rob Van Dam. And so we will have Rob Van Dam and Sabu on the house of Kayfabe from WrestleCade. 
Wow. Mm. That is exciting, and we cannot wait to be a part of that and so much more. Make sure you keep with us right here on YouTube. You want to make sure you subscribe and click the bell for the notifications, and we will be back here talking about more awesome stuff very soon on the House of Kayfabe. <laughs>